My entire life changed when I got involved in this incredible research project. This evolved into the co-founding of a biotech company currently developing a cancer vaccine. Now, while we are still in the early stages of the rigorous development and approval process, and additional clinical trials are necessary to further assess the potential safety and efficacy of our therapy, there are initial non-clinical and clinical, meaning human, results that inspire me as a person. I now believe that I can truly make a difference. Imagine this, my phone rings. I hear a desperate voice on the other end. Is this Lou? Is this Immunophotonics? Yes, I reply. I've heard about you. I've heard about your company, your technology. I've heard it from my friends, my doctor, and I need your help. I have stage four cancer. My doctor has told me I have failed all other options. And I have to tell that person, I have to tell this person on the other phone, I'm sorry, there is nothing I can do for you. I might go on to say that while there's a lot of exciting information about new therapies in development, they are too early, just as ours, to be used in any patient. We don't yet know if it is safe. We don't yet know if it is effective. Things have to go through a rigorous development and approval process. At this point, they always cut me off. My doctor told me I am going to die in 12, in eight, maybe four weeks. And I have to tell that person, I understand, I'm sorry. There is nothing I can do for you. But I don't understand. It's hard for me to witness this, let alone be the one that is a part of it. It baffles my mind that despite our incredible, our advanced healthcare system, that these types of patients slip through the cracks. Every time this happens, I immediately put myself in their shoes. What would I do? What would you do? Would you go home? Because I know myself, I would not. Just like that person who called me a few moments ago. The first thing I would do is think about who are the experts? Who are those with the medical and pharmaceutical knowledge to try and help me? Instantly, the first name that comes to mind is the FDA. This regulatory body does a fantastic job of advancing the public health by helping speed innovation and protecting the public by assuring the safety, efficacy, and security of new drugs. And their job is just that, to keep the population safe. Things have to go through this rigorous development and approval process before they can be made available to the public. And this makes sense to me. But when I research them, maybe I contact them. I will quickly learn that their job and their purpose is not to diagnose and treat patients. They are a public health agency. Click. At this point, I would research ongoing clinical trials for late stage cancer patients that have failed all other options. I would identify those trials and the physicians running them and I would request participation. Nine out of 10 times, that physician is going to come back and they're going to tell you, I'm sorry, you do not meet our criteria. I'm sorry, you cannot participate in this trial. You have to find something else. I'd take a deep breath before responding. 
Doctor, this is the only thing that is left for me. What about all of these exciting things I hear about, this exciting research I see every day on TV? And that physician may or may not give an opinion on the research, but they will tell you, you have to contact those researchers, those companies. Click. At this point, I would turn to the web, my pharma contacts, trusted scientific journals. I would identify the cutting edge technology that based on early research may have the potential to help me. I would then scour my network for contact information for these innovators, the researchers, the companies, the institutions, and I'd call them. Listen, I'd say, I've heard about your exciting therapy. I am running out of time. How do I get access to it? And as if it was almost scripted, they're going to tell you, just as I did, I'm sorry, there is nothing we can do. Click. Well, there you have it. You've heard from the experts, there is nothing they can do. And then I might ask myself out of anxiety, desperation, do these experts ever collectively work together based on their individual expertise to try and take developing therapies to those patients that need it the most? And not surprisingly, you would find, yes, they do. While they have different names all over the world, there are regulations and mechanisms that allow such access. In the US, we might call it an experimental IND. EU, we call it name patient, special access in Canada. Then in other parts of the world, Sweden, Germany, there are mechanisms by which late stage patients that have failed all other options can get access to experimental therapies that may or may not yet be in clinical trials. This is often referred to as early access or compassionate use. So if these programs really do exist, why don't we know more about them? Why are people not using them? And why are they not helping this patient in need? These are incredibly complex and difficult questions with a variety of answers. But very often the first thing I hear is that the regulatory bodies don't actually support these programs. I'm here to tell you that is not the case. Regulatory agencies genuinely want to save people's lives, which is why, if you meet their requirements, most of the time your request for one of these programs will be approved. In fact, the US FDA just revamped their policies to reduce the barriers of entry for some of our own programs here in the States. But I want you all to rem remember, these programs have their own purpose. This means they also have their own limitations. The mold does not work for everyone. There are still these patients that slip through the cracks. But as you can see, I don't believe the regulatory bodies are the gating factor to expanding these early access compassionate use programs. So based on my personal experience, I'm going to share with you a few issues that I believe contribute to the lack of expansion. The first issue I'd like to share with you is that it takes a great deal of resources to transition your novel experimental therapy into just your first patient. Not to mention the amount of resources required to move it through clinical trials and eventually to the public. Then, after you raise the cash or resources, which I can tell you is incredibly difficult, everything you do must add value. Almost every dollar you spend must be spent collecting valuable or enabling data. Enabling data is information obtained through controlled non-clinical and clinical research that can eventually be used in a regulatory filing such as a new drug approval. In contrast, these compassionate use programs, these early access programs, they do not produce enabling data. Therefore, these companies, 
They have a hard time spending their precious life blood or capital on such programs. The last point I'd like to share with you is that very often, in fact, most of the time, these experimental therapies have a limited safety and efficacy profile. This means there is a potential and real risk to the patient. Therefore, it's of incredible importance it's of incredible importance from a patient safety perspective to have an understanding with input from all of these experts before using any experimental therapy in any patient. But this is where I want to take a step back. I want to focus on one specific patient population. I want to focus on those patients that are told they are out of options. I want to focus on those patients that cannot get access to clinical trials. And I want to focus on those patients that are running out of time. These patients, they have been told by their caregiver that they are going to die. The morality inside me, it forces me to believe that if you have an experimental therapy that may have the potential to try and help someone with months maybe weeks left to live, that there should be a mechanism with input from all of the experts to try and help those in need. My team and I are striving to create just that. Specifically, we intend on launching an early access compassionate use program outside of the United States in three continents around the globe. The principal idea is that we will take and offer our experimental therapy to partner physicians that have the ability to administer our therapy to local patients that have failed all other options. To finance these expensive operations, we intend on collecting money from you. The general public through donation-based crowdfunding means, we intend on covering all of the expenses for this type of program. This includes doctor-physician time, nurse time, hospital space, materials, equipment, among other costs. By creating this funding mechanism, the company can continue to focus its limited resources on enabling projects to eventually take it to the market, while at the same time creating a pathway to try and help those patients who need it the most. In exchange, we will ask these patients to provide medical information before, during, and after treatment. That information will be maintained and organized in a centralized database for the purpose of creating a semi-controlled, but not enabling, profile on the experimental therapy. If a positive patient response is achieved, we will try to replicate it. If it can, in fact, be replicated, that data becomes more valuable. In particular, because we are focusing on late-stage patients with no options with such a short life expectancy. So by focusing on this patient population, by creating a funding mechanism to support these operations, and by working to demonstrate that the attained data can be valuable, I believe that we can expand these programs to the point where other companies, researchers, institutions begin to use their own resources, their own technologies, maybe even their own experimental therapies in this type of manner and try and help patients in need. I want you all to see this is the beginning of an incredible story. And it's not one about my company. It's not one about our technology. This is about impacting lives. And not just the patient's life. Yes, cancer affects the patient first, but then it affects their family, their friends, their community, and eventually our society as a whole. I'd now like to take a moment to share with you a brief video that I believe demonstrates the ripple effect or impact these compassionate care programs can have on the world. Mi nombre es Cirilia Luz Samaniego Samaniego. Mi cargo es de profesora coordinadora 
y mis funciones son hacer un trabajo pedagógico y administrativo en todos los programas no escolarizados de educación inicial. Antes del tratamiento estaba yo totalmente triste, muy asustada porque la palabra cáncer significaba ya muerte. Este, yo llegué al hospital Revaliati y me habían dicho que el cáncer estaba avanzado y no me podían operar. Y como es Dios tan grande que llegué a la, a la consulta de la doctora Ferrer. Y ella me indicó de que iba a venir un protocolo del extranjero a tratarnos el cáncer a través de rayos láser. Me hicieron cuatro tratamientos y a Dios gracias esto no llevaba a otras consecuencias. La mayor felicidad para mí es ver a los niños felices que concluyan la, la etapa de preparación que tenemos acá, el compromiso ¿no? de llevarlos y terminar sus cinco años y sacar pues la promoción como se dice de estos niños y en el camino cuando me encuentro con sus padres que me digan pues señorita mi hijito está yendo muy bien ya está haciendo su carrera esa es la mayor satisfacción This is just one patient story. And while additional clinical trials are needed to further assess the potential safety and efficacy of our approach, imagine if this is the beginning of a model supported by all of you that truly helps those who need it the most.